Yes, hello, welcome everybody again to the second episode of the Train Effective Podcast. Uh, I'm your host, Hashir, again, back, back again. And we've got a very special guest today, one of my good friends. He's played Division I college soccer here in America. I know something that a lot of players aspire to do. It is the one and the only Michael Deal. Mikey, how are you, bro? I'm doing great, man. I've been so excited to come on here. And uh, yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah, perfect. And I know we've been like, we've been talking about this for a while. Um, We've had a few calls on that just to kind of like schedule it and plan it and just talk about what we're going to talk about. And I think playing in college is obviously something like a lot of people, not only actually in America, but everywhere people aspired to. When I lived in England, like a lot of people wanted to play in uni. Um, And obviously, That's why we brought you on, to give us that value, give everybody that value. And Spotify listeners, welcome back. Obviously, this is also on YouTube, so sometimes we'll allude to the comment section. Those are just live comments coming in from people. Flack, Farah, how are you? Alexander, how are you, everybody? Welcome, guys. I hope you all, guys and girls, I hope you enjoy. Um, So, yeah, Mikey, people kind of know a little bit about me, but they know nothing about you yet. So... (laughs) Just kind of tell us a bit, like, who is this guy? Who is this guy with the white headphones? <laughs> Sounds good, man. Um, what's up, everybody? Uh, my name is Mikey Deal. Um, I'm 21 years old. I played college soccer the last three years uh, while I was getting my bachelor's degree at George Mason University, which is located in Northern Virginia. Um, fun fact, actually, that you may not know. Christian Pulisic, his parents both played soccer at George Mason University, and that's how they met. What? So that's kind of of mad. That's kind of mad. It's true. It's true. I actually didn't know this. No, so I'm serious. Dead serious. So anyway. Sorry, I thought they were in Pennsylvania, no? No, no. They live live in Hershey now, but they met Mm. playing soccer at George Mason University. They're both in, like, the Hall of Fame, so – Ah, uh, okay. Yeah, and that's to to the people that don't know, I'm also from Northern Virginia, so is Mikey. Um and George Mason is literally right down the road from us. It's like a with well without traffic. It's like I'd say 30 minutes. Oh, with traffic, traffic can be awful. probably. Yeah, probably double, <laughs> but so it's really close to us and yeah, that's I did not know that. But yeah, go on Mikey, about yourself. I completely interrupted you. No, nah, no, nah, it's okay. Um I only played for three years, even though, as some of you guys may know, um, you have four years of eligibility to play college soccer. Um, I graduated in three years, so I just thought it was a natural uh, stepping stone to kind of go in towards the working world. But um, I think that's one of the nice things about college soccer. Um, being a pro and uh, training to be a pro, it's wonderful and stuff, but some people like myself, um, focus also on like the professional world or professional life outside of um athletics and so the professional environment of college soccer was amazing for me um i'm so grateful that i got to do it and uh i'm glad that i can be on the podcast to uh shed some light on the three years yeah love that and college soccer obviously guys and uh everybody listening in america it's something that a lot of like youth players and even parents kind of like strive to get their like to play in one day um uh it's much more prevalent here college playing in college than it is in europe or other countries it's like the natural stepping stone i would say to the next level after high school years here in america and division one is the highest level of that next step uh in america so mikey you obviously played at that level but i want to I don't know. I want to I kind of want to go back to the early days because <laughs> we we grew up in the same area. Um however like obviously I'm a couple years older than you, but we grew up mm-hmm. in the same area. You even went to this we even yeah. went to the same <laughs> elementary school. Actually, yes, we sir. might have we might have been I, I'm thinking about it now. We might have been in that same school at the same time hey. cuz we might have like, passed each other in the hallways, like once I might or twice. Have, well, I might have like been mean to you at recess. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> but because when I wait, when I was in fifth grade at Tolbert, you must have been in what second grade? 
Yeah, or first grade, because we're like yeah, four years grade. apart. Yeah, because when I was a or senior, three. you were a freshman. Yeah. 11, 10, 9. So if I was fifth grade, you would have been you would have been in second grade. So you Probably. went to Tolbert in second grade, yeah? Yeah, yeah. So so we essentially I actually never knew. I didn't know. So like we went to we went to the same school at the same time. That's crazy. And did you play soccer like in elementary school between grades like kindergarten through fifth grade, which is like age five through I would say ten? Yeah, something like that. Yeah, of course. So I started kind of like the youngest you could start. I, I don't know why I decided to start. Um, I, my mom just signed me up for soccer, but I started when I was four. And I played all the way up until I was 21 years old. That was my last college soccer game. But a lot happened in between that. And it was quite a journey, honestly. Yeah, and that's that's kind of what like... That's kind of what I want to like get into, like what happened, because I feel like with soccer, like bro, like so much happens and we learn so much on our journeys, like wherever you're playing, you could play with the same team for like 10 years and like you can learn so much. So when you first started playing in elementary school, it was probably just like kick around stuff, right? Like, cause I don't think they have travel or anything. Yet oh yeah. I, I, I was always really competitive and wanted to be the best or like on the best team, but um so travel soccer, like that's like when I, there were like the teams were like sorted by like A, B, C team um, by tier. Yep. So obviously A team is the best, B is the second best. Um, I was on the B team actually for my first year of travel soccer, which probably was in elementary school. So maybe age 10 or 11 or something like that. Um, that's when like when you go into travel soccer, like slowly the game starts to get bigger in America. So you go from like 7v7 to 8v8 all the way up to 11 v 11 and um i actually i always strive to be on the a team but for years upon years it it was like the biggest struggle i just kept making the b team year after year after year i would try to get training opportunities with the a team which they always let me um train with them and it was good because you have to like get out of your comfort zone and put yourself in an environment where people are going to be better than you you're going to have to like be able to think faster it's going to like train you um, to be able to play at that higher level the more you immerse yourself in better playing environments. So I was always striving to do that, but I really wanted to make this A team. And I think I went through like six or seven straight years of not being able to make the team. And Damn, that was six or seven years. It was, it was honestly really tough. Um, and all this was like, like leading up until like I finally decided to switch club team, travel club team. Um, yeah right before I was a high school freshman. So like all throughout elementary school and middle school, I was like struggling to make a team and I faced a lot of rejection. And it, it's hard because like when you get rejected a bunch of times, you start to think like, you know, what am I doing wrong? Like, what do I have to do to like get to that next level? And um, hopefully you don't, but like sometimes you also start to make like dumb excuses and stuff. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. And I did do the right thing by switching teams and really like stepping out of like the comfort zone of the club I was in to go to a new club. Um, from there, everything kind of took off. And that was like during like the most important years of like development, in my opinion, which is like maybe 15 through 18. Yeah. 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 So because elementary, I think that age, like up until like 10, uh, I will say around 10, 11, like most players are just like doing kind of like, like, obviously smaller sided matches and stuff at least in america i know europe and sometimes i think they're playing on like full size pitches or something at that age but i think i'm not i'm not fully sure but um when you turned i would say when you entered high school mm -hmm. when you entered high school or like eighth grade high school you would be what probably like Ooh, it was like 14 like about to be 15 so yeah like your teenage years early teenage years like is that, did you have like a moment when you started like being like, okay, like, let me like take, take the, like my training. Cause I know you like, you're kind of <laughs> guys, there's this clip of Mikey and I don't have it with me, right now, but <laughs> there's this clip of Mikey doing the dribbling exercises and the dribbling exercise. It's similar to the, um, it's similar to uh, dribble and turn on the train effective app. And for those of you that don't know what that exercise is, just 
check it out on the app. It's free. Um, but this exercise, I saw a video of Mikey doing it, and I was like, oh, why is he speeding up his video? Like, what, what is he gaining from this? <laughs> and then, then I seen him go through these cones and shoot into goal. But, like, the shot was, like, such, like, a slow pass. Because I think he was just trying to pass the ball into the goal. And I was like, wow. So, that was actually, like, genuine. <laughs> he did it so freaking fast. So, that kind of brings me to the question, like, when did you start taking, like, individual training, like, really to the next level or really seriously at what age? Oh, this is actually a really good question. So, I did do, like, private sessions um because i was trying to think like you know what can i do to go from like the b team to the a team so i don't have to like keep facing this rejection and like the private sessions were you know they're cool and all but um i don't know it's like it's whenever it works for you and the person that's training you and i was like well if i actually want to see like improvement and like become a lot more consistent i gotta be doing this uh like on my own so i started to I don't know, just be super consistent from maybe age like 13 or 14 onwards and just training by myself. And it was honestly like pretty meditative. Like it was really enjoyable to get out, just put some music in and, you know, be able to like see how I was getting better at all these like certain drills that were like position specific, things that will like actually help you. Um, And I could go out and do this like anytime I want. So like life is like, like all about like, you know, trade-offs and stuff like that. So instead of playing FIFA, uh, like an hour and a half or something like that, like ultimate team, I would like go outside and I would train and then maybe I'd play FIFA afterwards, but I'd make sure to do that training because those individual sessions are definitely like what made me as a player, kept me consistent and just uh, getting me ready for like the big moments, whether it be in a game or a tryout. That's interesting. FIFA, do you, do you, so you were, you were like a FIFA. You were FIFA. Oh yeah. You so all the way okay. back to like FIFA 12. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Hey, l- listen, me, I was like that, that, that kind of FIFA is actually low key. Like why I initially got into like soccer or football, whatever you want to call it in like 20, 2010 world cup. That was actually my introduction to the game. Um, and I would say the world as well to uh, football, <laughs> but 2011, like, or 2010 fall, I would say I borrowed FIFA 10 and FIFA 11. I don't know why both from one of my friends and it was on PS2, PlayStation 2. Oh God, Bad that's... graphics. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was awful, but bro, for me, it was the most fun thing. And I remember like scoring so many goals and I'd be like, and it would always be offside. I'd be like, what the hell? Like, what is offside? Like, like where's this rule? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So like every, like I'd like, obviously like cognitively, I wasn't that advanced back then. So I just kept on like scoring offside goals and be like, <laughs> surely one of these are going to count. And, um, but to be fair, uh, back then, like as a child, but FIFA did teach me like, oh, this is like what formations are. Like, this is how the teams usually like uh, line up. Oh, you can have three defenders, four defenders. This mm-hmm. is what a striker is. And though that like initially, like, I I enjoyed playing FIFA back then, and um, yeah, it's a it's an interesting one the the analogy you use with FIFA because I think for a lot of players, if you because obviously you played in college Division One, and like people forget like athlete, but you're a student athlete. You Dude, know? you have to, yeah, you have to do you have to do schoolwork as well. So I think I'll touch on the schoolwork, but before that. With FIFA, if people actually added up the amount of time they played FIFA, like per week, and just turned that into time they were training, or Dude, I don't know, they, they'd be they'd be sick. Everyone <laughs> would be everyone would be insane. Like exactly. I still played, I still played a lot of FIFA, but like yeah. I also like made sure that I was you know training a lot on my own. But it all comes from within. Like that's because I wanted to get better. And because I was, like, so sick of, like, being on, like, the B team and, like, not being on, like, a team at, like, the level I knew I could be at. And I knew and had the self-belief that I could get there because I saw it was paying off. So I just knew that if I kept going by myself, putting myself in better environments, that, you know, it would all come to fruition eventually. Wait, so did you – did progress motivate you? Oh, yeah, 100%. Yeah, because, like, the thing is, like, my whole – like my whole youth soccer career was 
like I was on the B team for so long. Then like I made, I didn't make a step up to the A team, but like when I got into high school, I said I switched clubs. I went to a team that was better that could compete with the A team, but just still wasn't at the A team level. Yep. And in my, so it's like, it's a, it's a pretty good step up, like a medium step up. But in my last high school year, so when I was 17, 18, I moved up onto literally like the best club team I could like in the area. So it was like a pro, it was just like progress, like all those years, really. Um, mm, okay. Yeah. Cause I know for some people, like people have different motivating factors, right? Some yeah, people, yeah. they get motivated by the people making fun of them. Some people get motivated by like uh, actually like failure. You know, they they might fail a few times, and they're like, "Bro, like this sucks. Like, I don't like this. Like, like never again." And you know, it's debatable if that's like a good way to like motivate yourself. But to each their own. So it's mm -hmm. interesting that for you you saw success, and you were like, "Oh, you mean if I keep if I keep doing like if I keep training, if I keep working." I'll just get more success. Is that kind of how you thought? Yeah, definitely. I think definitely something along those lines, it would have had to have gone like that because um, I had a uh, something big with me was just like, I had a lot of self-belief as well. And like, I had the belief that if I work a lot on myself, that, you know, once I step onto the field, like at a certain tryout or in a certain environment, like that work from before, like I had a super strong belief and sense that it will pay off and it will show. And that really kept me going a lot. Mm, that's so interesting. That's so interesting because you, you know, like you've played on many teams before and like you see players of like all levels and maybe like say on the B team, everyone's like of a certain minimum level, but mm -hmm. you might have varying levels of like confidence in each player. Some player you can kind of see like, when he messes up, like, he's, like, down bad, you know? Other mm -hmm. players, when they mess up, they're, they're kind of, like, don't care. And people might call that person, like, arrogant or this and that, like, but no, that's just their way of coping with mistakes. Like, they're fine. They're confident, you know? They know that yeah, that mistake course. doesn't define them. So I love that you you kind of got motivated by progress. And I'm, I'm not going to lie. I'm the same just in life in general now, like, it's like sometimes when I get a taste of something and I see like this works, I'm like, okay, let me take this and run with it in essence. Yeah, because if you may, if if you achieve a small goal, then you're just like, well, what's the ceiling? Like how how much further can I go? It's just a natural thing to think about. So Yeah. Did you so did, when did you did you have that goal of playing division one? Cause I just to put it out there for everybody listening, playing division one in America is not easy. Because first of all, uh, you have Division One, Division Two, II, Division Three. That's the NCAA system. You also have NAIA, which is a separate, essentially a separate like conference and organization that's not affiliated with NCAA. And then you have JUCO, Junior College, which is two-year schools. Division One is like the highest. The MLS draft player, the people that are getting drafted in there, they're coming from Division One like most of the time. Um, did you have the goal of playing Division One? Because I remember when you were in ninth grade, I was twelve. <laughs> we, both, we, both, we both played varsity. I didn't know like you were like aiming for that or you were going like aiming for that or anything because you're quite like quiet at the time. Yeah, I was a little quiet ninth grader. Yeah. That's a, that's a really interesting question. I think like back around like eighth grade, ninth grade, so just like getting into high school, I I just knew that I loved the game so much and that I just wanted to keep playing as long as I could at the time. So I was like, well, I mean, the next step at the next highest level, unless, you know, you're just like an insane prodigy and can go pro out of high school, which is extremely rare. Like I was just like, well, the next highest step is division one college soccer. And I know I'm going to be, around and playing with people that are going to make that level i was really confident that i knew people that were going to be at that level so i said i wanted to go there with them and um yeah that just comes from also surrounding yourself with people in like a really um good playing environment to be honest ooh, ooh, ho, 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 that's a good one because you from what i just heard like did you actually think of d2 or d3 or you were just like no i want division one 
I didn't really know that much about D2 or D3, but like I I I really only like thought about Division 1 to be honest. I'm I'm not going to lie. I, I listen, I love that because essentially what you did was and I think like with humans like this and correct me if I'm wrong or what your experience is with this like we have to be like willing and open to like a possibility for our like actions to align with the you know like say you did say your like say your mindset always hypothetically was yeah i'd like to play in college if i could play in d3 that'd be great your actions and the work you put in is probably going to align with that and you're going to use all your resources to play in d3 but for you your expected like reality you're like division one you know like do you think that right there had like a big like part to play in that's a super good point and honestly no disrespect to d3 schools at all there's some d3 schools that are like they have really good players they could beat some lower level d1 schools like i'm certain of that but at the same time like division three is a lot more relaxed and um it's like compared to division one but you still have to work like really hard and obviously put blood sweat and tears into it of course um but I probably would have not been so determined in like how I marketed myself and stuff because division one, oh. they get a lot of emails and stuff from people. So like if you're trying to like pursue, like to make a division one soccer team or like get scouted by them, you really have to be like putting yourself out there to them. I spent a lot of time marketing myself because that's really what it is. That's like, kind of how I always thought about it. And I think it's maybe the most realistic way to think about the recruiting process, to be honest. So I don't know if you know this, Mikey, but um, Nick, actually, you know, Nick. So when Nick was um, in, I think when he was like in his teenage years, he sent like an email to like, I think hundreds of college coaches or something, um, mm-hmm. if not thousands like uh, just like you said, the market. I've, I've, s- I've said hundreds. I'm not gonna lie. Like over a period of two or three years, like I have. Like it's and it's gotten me. It got me a lot of like decent leads, but most emails I never, ever, ever got responses to. So yeah, well, that's what he did, and he. I don't know how like, but he did get like some like solid like offers, offers and stuff like full rides and all this stuff to play in America. So. <laughs> it's interesting you might send thousands hundreds or thousands of emails for if you want to play in college and this actually applies to like um like professional as well if you know coaches or smaller clubs or if you're trying to play like uh like amateur semi-professionally and then move up the ranks you might have to send hundreds or thousands of emails and linkedin messages or whatever it might be but the thing is you just need one you know you just Mm -hmm. need you're doing all that just to have one solid hit and i think that's that's something that i think people need to understand is like yeah it's a lot of work putting sending a hundred something emails or a thousand emails but in In your case go ahead oh and i just wanted to clarify that's also like over a long period of time like i wouldn't just send all these emails like all at once it was before tournaments like with two weeks before tournaments because coaches have to plan who to go watch Mm. so it was before these tournaments it's before if i went to a camp uh i have like three or four different highlight videos over my high school years so if i made a new highlight video i would put like a little note in the subject that i made a new one and that would go to any coach that i was trying to get recruited by so it's like all these different things um that led me to sending these emails like all these different like events and stuff that popped up Uh, it wasn't all at once it was over time you were you were strategic about it bro i don't know you were strategic like this like (laughs) dude guys if you if you guys met if you guys knew mike in real life this guy is a he's that guy that's like accidentally funny if that makes (laughs) sense Yo, like chill. he'll like he'll, he's like he's one of the funniest people i know but like such like a obviously a humble great dude but he, he is so damn funny like on accident <laughs> it's amazing but th- that's why i bring to the point like behind all the laughs and that like like obviously 
excellent player, great student and that, but you were like really strategic about it because you sent these emails before tournaments. And I know for a fact, cause I played travel as well. I played club as well. Um, mm -hmm. And so we would have like, the, you know, in America we have showcases. So mm -hmm. for, for non-American listeners, essentially in the U S if you're playing club football, club soccer, you have, you know, weekends where you might have a showcase in another state or another part of the country. And lots of teams go over there, usually decent level teams. Um, you go there, you're playing like three, four games in like two days. It's kind of crazy, actually. Um, but yeah, it all is. these all, yeah, all these college coaches come from various schools. And the, literally the point of the showcase is for you to get spotted, you know, for you to get noticed. And Mikey, what you did is you hit up some of these coaches before the showcase. Like, that's so smart. Yeah, no, it's what you have to do because they come with a list of – a lot of coaches come with, like, lists of players that they'll specifically go see because, you, obviously, if there's maybe, like, like, I don't know, 10, 12, 14, 16, however many fields there are at these big showcases, I mean, they have to have, like, a play, and they're not just going to go there and, like, sit around and, like, hope huh. they, like, come across someone at the field. They want to have, like, I don't know. Uh, purposeful action like with what they do so I mean I did that myself and I sent it to the coaches that I uh, was interested in you know hopefully having them scout me but it, it also has to be like like good or like done well on my part it can't just be the day before like you might get one coach that comes but I mean they probably already have like people they're looking at so so I low-key did not know it was like that <laughs> <It's kind of laughs> I thought it was like uh, the movie goal you know, do you know? <laughs> I do know. I do know. Yeah. When um, Glenn Foy, guys, guys, if you haven't watched Goal, just go watch it. <laughs> even on YouTube for free. It's crazy. Um, that movie, I must have watched it like a billion times. That and the second one. The third one, I never watched because I heard it's bad. But essentially, in Goal, Glenn Foy is like this ex Newcastle United player turned um, not age, not turned agent, but he's like works on cars, but he's not become an agent. Because he's at this field in L.A. visiting his, like, sister or whatever, or his daughter. And he sees this player named Santiago Munez playing Sunday League, just tearing it up and dribbling through everybody. And he gets him, at a, gets him a trial at Newcastle, and then Santiago goes on to play at Real Madrid, and it's crazy. I low-key, low-key, kind of <laughs> thought it was like that. Because, just the same. <laughs> because I was like, bro, there are so many teams, so many players... Um, even sometimes not so many age groups because you do have that kind of like usually it's like young high school age but I always did wonder how they kind of spotted players because bro <laughs> like college coaches like yeah they in season is that fall season here in America but then you have to recruit like essentially year round yeah it, some some of the ways that they would recruit you know like a team parent has like a pamphlet some coaches really do just like show up to fields and you know they might become interested in someone they weren't even looking at um they'd usually get their information from um like uh if a parent has like a team pamphlet with all like the names and contact information for people i mean i've had people that have been at a game for somebody else but have seen me and like were a little bit interested in me so it's not all like just you know just emailing um to, you know, get, like, a connection with a coach. It, it can just be by chance, though, like, 100%. Mm, yeah, I feel that. Now, in terms of, let's talk about how you actually got to George Mason, because uh, George Mason, like, I know there's, like, different conferences and stuff for Division One college soccer, but you guys play against some good teams. No, like they, some solid teams. Yeah, the A10. It we're in the A10 conference, and this this past season or the past like couple seasons like haven't been like the best like for the team. But like the team's history is, you know, it's quite good, honestly. When you look at the record over the past like 10, 15 years, um, the the quality of competition it's like, it's pretty high. Like there are a number of people like depending on like whatever team. Well, just like in college in general, if you're a good player, like a really good player at a Division One school, it's not surprising to go into pro. I've had past teammates from a couple of years ago uh, go on to play at different levels in America, but you know the level is quite good. Um, the how so? Just before that, how 
so let's say you're ninth grade, yeah, high school, early high school. Yeah, yeah. How 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 did how did you actually like get to George Mason, if that makes sense? Because from my understanding, it didn't happen for you until like quite late. A lot of players, they, I think they like commit to colleges in like tenth grade, eleventh grade. Oh, you yeah. kind of you kind of went late. So how did that? Tell me about that process, because I actually haven't heard this process before. Either. Yeah, this is new okay. To so actually, like. Uh, they always keep changing like the dates of like when like coaches are allowed to talk to you and stuff. But like, I think the new rule is like, like college coaches can communicate with players, like starting their junior year of high school. Like before they couldn't like talk to you, like personally uh, for me until like senior year, um, unless you were on like a visit at their school or something like that. Yeah. But um, honestly, those dates are just confusing and kind of irrelevant to this right now. Um, so with Mason, with George Mason, um, I got like a camp email. So like when you're young, all you can get is like camp emails. Like when you're in like ninth grade, 10th grade, like all you can get is like, like it's almost like spam sometimes if you don't want to go to the camp, obviously, but it, it'll be like, Oh, like, hello. So-and-so we invite you to our college ID camp, uh, come out and for this amount of time and, you know, we'll watch you play. So I got that email, but and, and so then I thought more about George Mason. I was already kind of thinking about George Mason because it's a local school. And, you know, if you're in America and you go to an in-state public school, it's a lot cheaper, relatively yeah. speaking, yeah, yeah, than, yeah, than, yeah. A pri- oh, yeah. than a private school, than a private school. Yeah. But it's still it still costs. Um, yeah. So I became interested in George Mason because like the good deal, like of it being a private or public school, lower cost, relatively speaking, and nearby to my house. So I started to put them on like the email list for going like to tournaments and stuff. Like I had my own list of college coaches that I would email. Um, Mm. I did go to, I did go to one of their camps, one of their ID camps in 10th grade. So I didn't actually think I did that. Like, like I didn't think I was anything special, but I I thought I did well because I was playing with mostly 11th and 12th graders. Um, I kept, yeah. Those were because you were in 10th grade. You were playing with players older than you. Yeah, so there were a good amount of players older than me. There were also players my age as well. But I kept trying to ping them emails whenever there was a chance to see me play. So there was another camp I went to not too long after where, like, one of their assistant coaches was at this camp. There's some camps, they have many different college coaches at one specific camp. So that's really good, like, a good deal for a player if you can hit a yeah. camp and you have, like, maybe – 10 or 15 college coaches that are there. So you know what? Maybe you can get seen by like multiple at once in like a more intimate environment. Um, yeah. So I I did another camp where they came to see me at a different school's camp. And so like that kind of like got me like talking to their assistant coach a little bit. And then from then on, I just kept messaging about tournaments. And I kept, I went to one more George Mason camp And, like, by that point, like, the coach had seen me a decent amount and he was starting to get more interested in me because it was all kind of culminating. Like, I was putting myself in front of him more and more and he was becoming more and more interested. So by 11th grade, when I went to their camp and he kept watching me, like, at tournaments in 11th grade, um, I started to – well, I got an offer, like, shortly after. Mm, So you – Damn. Okay, so it, it, this definitely wasn't like a like a sniper situation. Where no, it, it wasn't like just, one and just, done. It, it was a process. So you, yeah. you, 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 you say, I'm gonna give you like like loss of flowers. <laughs> you, 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 you cultivated this over time, and like you essentially built that relationship with this like coach as well, with the school, with this program in general. Like they've seen you over time; they got familiar with how you play. And essentially, obviously, you still have to be like proper good because it's Division One. But you really built that relationship with them. I built the interest for sure. Yeah, and it was a lot of like timely things. So just emailing them to come to my games, and you know, if they were there, they'd see like one or two. Um, they they'd probably catch like a half or something because they got to go like see other people. And like I would also go. I went to a number of camps where there would be a coach of George Mason at the camp, and just getting in front of them and knowing what they already know about me, it probably means they're going to watch me a little bit. 
And so they did. And, you know, it was just all about building that interest um, over time. It wasn't like a sniper situation. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah, but, yeah. But for some people, like it might be, it just, it might just be that. But in my experience, it was, not, it was not like that, to be honest. Yeah. So what I'm, what I'm kind of, what I'm kind of getting is, to play at that, and maybe it's Division One, whatever level. But like, you need to obviously you need to do your individual training, right? You need to do your team training. You need to do your individual training. You need to, like, due diligence, essentially. Identify what you're not that good at. Improve it. Your strengths, just improve them even more. But while you're doing all that, you still need to focus on getting your name out there. They're not going to know you exist just because oh, yeah. like you do. Like, unless, I'm tall. Unless, <laughs> unless you're, like, playing on, like, the youth national team or, like, coaches will talk about you because you're on one of the best club teams in America and you're like winning all these awards. Like, yeah, your, your name is not going to be known. You have to put your name out there. And that's why I said you have to market yourself. You really do. Yeah. 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 I love that. I love that because I think that's such a thing. Like so many players miss out on in high school because I'm not going to lie. Like, to me, uh, like, I, I played Loudoun, right? Loudoun soccer. And mm -hmm. I played on a couple teams. But when I was in 11th grade, I played. I'm a 97. I played on the 95 B team. I went from the 97 C team to the 95 B team in, mm -hmm. after one travel season because I guess I've done well enough. Um, but, like, in those years like you have like these opportunities are there these showcase events are there they're made for the players essentially um and i can't like this is really opening my eyes to like marketing yourself if you want to play in college to, there's a yeah. lot of schools man there's a lot of schools that want good players yeah and uh it's it's important to be professional as well like i i know um a lot of people like recommend like you know if you can like also like say a couple things like about what you like about the school um you know so it's not just like one of these like really like form letter type emails that you send to schools and i did that sometimes in the beginning and i do think the coaches appreciated that i actually like researched their school like said a couple things said how i like their uh the liberal arts emphasis about their school done um, your homework yeah, I've done my homework. That's that's pretty much it. But sometimes I do think coaches, not going to lie, because they get so many emails, they, they really will just want to see your video and they'll they'll get to know you as a person when they talk to you later. So yeah. after a while, I kind of just like switched gear, like like switched the whole like game plan. And I really was just like, I got to the point. I told him what my schedules were. I told all these coaches how I have a new video. I would attach it. I would make sure it's not too long. I'd make sure I would have my best clips in the beginning. I'd make sure to highlight myself because you wouldn't believe how many college clips I've seen that are just like, like oh, I'm, I'm, just, I'm just like, wait, why did you like make the video like that? One, I can't even like <laughs> see who you are on the field. Yeah. And two, yeah. like, I mean, it's just like the music choices and stuff. I mean, it, all they want to see is you as a player. Like yeah. it's super simple, but video is like really important. I'm not gonna yeah. lie. I've um, and that that that's actually a big thing about the marketing aspect for me, guys. And this is if you want to play professionally as well, right? This is college, and if you're looking for professional trials, just listen up really quick. If you're doing a highlight video, make sure it's of good quality. It's 2021, right? Nowadays, <laughs> you can record like, like not my, not on like, a toaster. Yeah, now yeah yeah yeah. Or um, or a microwave or a spatula. <laughs> that didn't make sense. Anyways, um, <laughs> um, nowadays we can even record on our phones. But if it's your mate, your girlfriend, um, your boyfriend, your parents, anybody, pay someone like to film you. Get a good video of you. But once you do have that video, I need you guys to actually easily in a good quality way identify yourself in the video don't say in the beginning of the video oh number seven left wing and then the rest of the video is just clips of like the whole field because people are going to be like it's hard to see the seven on your shirt like nobody you want to make these videos as easily like viewable for people that are watching them as possible so 
get somebody that does videos and have them circle you in the video. You know, mm. I, I've seen so many videos before where it's like, it, it, it might be a highlight of somebody, Mikey, and it's like the most perfect cross into the box. And it's like such a good finish. And I'm like, hold on, like, <laughs> What's that which one? Well, what, did, did you cross it or did you yep. score? Which one was it? So do Yo, your I'm... like due diligence to like make good like videos. And I I made video. I've made I've done like obviously I know how to use Adobe Premiere Pro. So I've made videos for people before, and I make sure to like do the little circle on them, mm -hmm. so you know you can see who's who. You were yo, saying, yo, dude, honestly, like to like anybody that hears this and if you make like a highlight video yourself like it's like all you need is like iMovie and maybe like a simple like YouTube like I don't know like tutorial search like I did all the videos myself I just looked up how to freeze frame something yeah. and then how to put a picture in picture so like I would take like a like a circle. circle yeah yeah transparent circle yeah. and I would just put it around myself after I like freeze framed an image or like freeze framed a part of the video and you know it was all easy like um it was all like super easy like you can all do it yourself as well so uh but video quality is like super important um i'm not gonna lie yeah and this guy now uh, one of our comments and to the spotify listeners we uh we obviously have running comments shake candy he said uh, iMovie is the way to go it, it really is it just might be. I've never used it. I don't it's so have it. simple. It's so um, simple, but it's effective. I've heard. So that oh, it's effective. No pun intended. Yeah, no, <laughs> no, no pun intended. Genuinely. No pun intended. Seriously. Um, and then Mikey. So now you've done all your homework. Like you've been essentially offered, and now you're at George Mason. I feel like so many people think like um, once you get to a certain level even and it's the same thing with professional it's like when people are like if i could just sign this contract like i'll be set you know mm -hmm. and it's like it's from what i've seen and my intuition tells me it's not like that once you get there you have to like even work harder if not the same oh, yeah you know? No, 100%. Yeah. So when I went in, like, I was one of the youngest people, like, obviously, because I'm a freshman. And well, it turned out that most of the team was were, uh, it consisted of upperclassmen. So that's people who are like, either, like, so I was like 18. The, my teammates were mostly like 21 or like 20, 20 and a half. So like, they have a full like two, three years on me. And some of my teammates, because college soccer is interesting, you can have internationals that come over. Yes. And they're actually a lot older. Some of my teammates were 25. So that's a seven year difference. Yeah. So imagine like going in and like they have all this experience on you. I mean, uh, the hard work starts like you, you start over basically when you're there and you really have to, you know, like work your way into the system. It's not easy, but I set my goals really. Uh, I'm going to say like, I went in with no expectations so that I wouldn't be disappointed. And I wanted to say that or I wanted to see if like I could get any play time. Other than yep. that, it's a, it's a fantastic learning experience. I'd be happy to get any play time. It turns out I was, I was able to get a lot of play time in the beginning because I worked really hard and I saw like a place where I could potentially earn a spot. And I did, I, I got injured, so I didn't get to, you know, play too much after that. But you Wait, know, ex you're expand, sorry, expand on that because you said you saw a place where you can, yeah, so I, get in. So, so tell, I, tell us about that. Yeah, I so I mostly played center back. Um, I played right back my final year of club soccer because I thought I was a really capable defender, and like my center backs on my club team were like set, but like right back was kind of open, so I tried to like play right back. Mm -hmm. I got pretty good at it, but I still considered myself as like more of like a center back. When I got to George Mason, the center backs is the same thing. It was kind of set, but I still thought like, oh, I played well at right back last season on like one of the best club teams in like the country. So I was like, well, why don't I just try to play right back in college? And I ended up, you know, I worked super hard and I just like had confidence. I kept my head down. I didn't do anything to get myself in trouble as a freshman because, you know, freshmen will get picked on if they do dumb crap, to be honest. Yeah. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. yeah, I was able to, you know, earn a starting spot early on in the season. So, yeah. So I love that. Um, okay. This is like, what is the spam? Um, how did you, so you said you worked hard, right? And we, we kind of, 
we kind of like we hear work hard like all the time right like of course yeah yeah not 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 all the time but like what what do you mean by that like what did you what how did you how did I, you work hard what did you do I worked hard like mentally as well like because you have to be like focused and like you have to keep that like consistency so like yeah, putting an emphasis on like showing up like ready for training sessions stuff like that like how are you going to like prepare like before training session because we were doing like we start in preseason by doing two a days and we don't do that for very long but still like that drains you so like what are you going to like do like to recover in between and stuff so that you're ready for the next one um stuff like that but yeah I, big thing for me was like like i talked about like early on like if you have like self-belief it can go a long way and like that coupled with just like being focused and like mentally preparing the best way that I know how to because everyone has their own habits like before a game like for me I don't listen or like before practice like I don't listen to music before those things I like to keep like a really clear mind but not like listen to anything just like huh. be dead set focused on like what's coming up so I made sure to do that uh recover well and yeah just you didn't listen to music? No, no, no. Wow, that's interesting. I, I always listen to music. I think most people do, but I, I prepared my own way. I, oh, I yeah, know. 100%. It, it, no, it, I love it that. It worked. And it worked. I've seen, so. I, I've seen um, this video of uh, Gareth Bill. He was an interview of his as well. Like, it, this, was, this was a long, long time, time ago. And he said, I think, the same thing, where he doesn't, um, he wouldn't, like, listen to music before the match. We just kind of like literally what you just said like kind of clear his mind mm -hmm. and obviously it done him pretty well um, yeah oh also amazing player one more th one more thing like uh before i came in and stuff like even when i was on vacation with my family like i would still find time in even the most like unorthodox settings to like you know do work on my own like if i needed to ask my dad to like help like you know take a touch and like pass me the ball for like a drill like i would ask him for help because like i wanted to be fresh and like really ready to go mm. so it, it, it's that stuff worked for me and i'm a hundred percent confident that it would work for other people like if you just keep you know just going like uh doing your one-on-one -on -one or just like individual training sessions being consistent with it it helps so much it prepares you honestly yeah and and you you were big like because obviously I was big and I'm still big on individual training. Um, I think it is kind of like therapeutic, as we were talking about the other day. Like just kicking, just being at the like on the pitch and just kicking the ball is amazing. But having a plan and like working on weaknesses is like it's just so important because it's if you think about any if you think about companies if you think about I don't know schools if you think about how humans learn it's all actually pretty similar in terms of the formula you identify something that you're not as good at you make a plan to get better at it then you execute the plan and then you obviously reap the rewards of being better at it mm -hmm. um and did you ever like have like set training like goals and training plans of like oh like my my first touch isn't good enough i have to like do x y and z to improve it did you ever like really plan like that Honestly, I loved – so I I only ever I, – I trained – this is this is actually a super interesting question. So there's like this one quote that I remember. I don't remember if like Xavi said it or somebody else, but it was like, don't train until you get it right. Train until you can't get it wrong. Yeah. So like I with certain things that was mostly just like, you know, like first touch drills and stuff and like dribbling drills, like I really was – trying to train so like it wasn't like oh do it right like once or twice and you'll be good like it was like do it right like you know like five or six times in a row like at the speed that i wanted to do it and mm -hmm. i that's how i felt like i would accomplish like a like my goals in the training session so like where like i wasn't making like the same mistakes or errors and it was like super clean that was kind of like how i how i trained um, so to you, be honest, you, you been, that means you probably did more reps then because you were training to like, like not like yeah, make, like not make any mistakes. But being perfect is like impossible, and I was never oh, going yeah. for perfection. Yeah. Like it's literally impossible to be perfect. But yeah. like I was, 
I figure that if I do something a certain it's amount a of reps, yeah, like I won't, if, if I'm doing it like well and like practicing it a lot, I should make far less mistakes. So, yeah, 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 yeah. That's so, that's so interesting because I always tell like players, because obviously we have, um, on the train effective app guys, we have obviously for pro plans, we have one-on-one -on -one coaching and mentoring and I help with that. And I'm pretty familiar with the train effective content on our app. So when players do ask me, I do tell them on certain exercises and well, on all exercises and workouts, I tell them that, yeah, like it's okay to mess up. Like you're going to mess, you're not going to have every rep is not going to be perfect. But I want you to, if you do, I don't know, 20 shots on goal. This is just an example 20 shots on goal. I don't want you to count the one that like slowly sailed into the middle of the net, you know? I want you to count the reps that were driven hard or, you know, like you, you curled in perfectly or really well into the corners reps that like were really good. Cause if you're counting your bad or average reps, what's going to show up in the matches, you know, mm -hmm. you're essentially training yourself. You're training your mind. You're training yourself to accept these average reps and those just won't fly in the games. Whereas on the flip side, if you're training match speed, reps and match speed actions and you're getting used to those in the matches that's what's going to show up because that's what you've been you know that's kind of your norm so i love that you said that yeah no honestly it was just i don't know when i saw the quote i was like dang that's actually a really good point because if you train to like not get it wrong then i mean like even when you do like make the odd mistake or two like you're going to be far more consistent than if you just do it once and you're like, all right, yeah, I'm good. Like yeah. I've accomplished that. So like, you know, I don't know. Consistency was a big thing with that. Yeah. 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 Consistency. I love that, man. And so in George Mason, um, you obviously played with, you played with some good players and you like, obviously some of the best players because they went on to play at various levels across America or the world. Um, and how did you, when you first enter this new environment? Yeah. Like, I, I just want to picture it. you, you come in, you know, I don't know if you have an orientation or whatever you come to the room, team meeting, you know, you see all, you meet all uh, the lads for the yeah, first yeah. time. It's, yeah. Everyone's got their George Mason stuff on. And yeah. if you could show YouTube your jacket right now, that'd be great. Actually. You oh, little, oh, George oh, it's on Mason this side. Jacket. Yeah, there yeah, you yeah. go. I I'm repping so, it. I'm repping it for the pod. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so you go and you know, all the lads are there, the coaches are there. You just, Hey, like I'm Mikey or I'm Michael. You probably said, I don't know. Uh, but... Yeah. I don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> and so I'm like, how do you kind of, how did you manage that mentally? Like, Oh man, like these are all upperclassmen. I'm just right out of high school and I have to really like, essentially, I don't know if earn my place is the way to say it, but is I this... have to, I have this... to like you know earn my place here how do yeah. you yeah this is a really good question so uh, everyone's like different like socially like for me personally i i think over time like i can really like connect with people like as long as you know um i'm not like you know late for training and all and they won't give any attention to me so i wasn't really like worried about like uh building connections with people i, I thought it would like slowly come and because you know i'm a pretty chill easygoing guy like that stuff would all come but uh, I really wanted to like um, get in there by like proving myself. So like from the first thing that we do, yeah. it, we did like a fitness test. I think it was like the beep test. Yeah, we did, we did the beep test my freshman year. And I was like, I saw people that like weren't doing as well as I thought, like even for like a division one program. So I was like, all right, well, I've been training on my own. So I'm going to come in here. I'm going to, I'm going to beat them at their, the beep test, even though I'm a new guy. <laughs> and I, I think I'll gain some respect from some of them. And so I really just like was there keeping my head down, did the beep test, did the best out of the freshmen that were there. And like probably maybe all of the underclassmen, to be honest. And, um, yeah. And after that, it was just like, you know, keep your head down playing, but like, you know, play with a purpose, you know, play to like compete really well with everybody and just gain the respect of everybody. That's kind of like how I approached it, to be honest. And, yeah. and I was a bit shy. So I did want to have like my play and like my work ethic and stuff do the talking, honestly. Mm -hmm. Okay. I got you. I feel that. Yeah. I feel like sometimes if you come in and like you make an, 
not just like physically, but like uh, just like too much noise. All of a sudden, it does kind of place this expectation on you. You know, like as a freshman, yeah, it's not a good idea. It, unless you're like insane, what maybe you can have like a little bit of an ego, but like I don't know, I'm not a fan of that. Yeah. Like to be honest. Yeah. Yeah, you're more of the you're more of the, you know, just like Nice walk on the beach type, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> uh, head, head, head down focus, but like, you know, have a good time like it, at the right time, you know? So at yeah. least in soccer. So it's, it's, it's good, man. I love yeah. that. Um, so kind of we'll be wrapping up soon. Um, I And guys, I just want to touch on a few things. Obviously, Mikey's familiar with the Train Effective app, but I'll just kind of let you guys know recently on our app, uh, Spotify listeners as well. We have two new tabs at the bottom of the page. We've got the train and the learn tabs. And under these tabs, it's now more easy. It's the courses, uh, masterclass videos, analysis videos. They're more easily accessible. So they're more easy to find as well for you guys. And just easy, few taps, you can access those. Uh, as well as the train page, which will get you to your workouts new challenges on every Monday as well. And we're, as always, every week, we're going to be releasing new updates. So every podcast, we will let you know what's going on. Um, be sure to check out the te- the training plans tab under the train page. We have the superb Sala challenge right at the top. <laughs> so if you guys want to uh, be in... Be- best player of the world, best player in the world right now. <laughs> yeah, listen, I, I, I'm, I'm, agreeing Arguably. With, I'm agreeing with that. Um after Emil Smith Rowe, of course, but no, not sure. <laughs> <laughs> but if if you guys do want to, you know, take advantage of that, our app is free. Download the Train Effective app; it is free to use. Um, just wanted to shamelessly plug that in there. Now, Michael Deal, I do want to ask you, kind of as we wrap up. Wow, fifty six minutes. How? What <laughs> is like? What is kind of? What's your biggest lesson? that you learned on this journey to playing college soccer and playing in college, you know, because so many people aspire to that. And I know you might not think it because you were always so in it, like so training, head down, focus, but so many people aspire to that. What would you tell the 15 year old or the 14, 13 year old that wants to play division one soccer, but might be on the B team right now or something? Dude, there's so many different things. I wish you asked me this earlier so I could come up with, like, the best answer. But, like, (laughs) I have to, like, if I was talking to, like, a 13, 14, 15-year-old, like, you know, self-confidence, but, like, like a true self-belief, like, is, like, really important. Like, having, like, self-efficacy. So, like, you knowing that what you do to yourself, you're in control of what you can do, like, to improve yourself, and that will like lead you to improve in like other areas so i like to think that i had like a really high self-efficacy so i thought that i was in control of what i could control with myself i'd go out and put myself in uh, better playing environments and you know sometimes it would be tough in the beginning but by playing in these environments and putting yourself out there with players that were better than you like you're gonna you're gonna get comfortable with being in uncomfortable situations and that that was like something really powerful for me. Like I would not have improved. If- oh, guys, I don't know what happened to Mikey. I think his phone died. Um, <laughs> but I think to wrap up what, what he was saying was get uncomfortable. Be okay with being in uncomfortable situations. And these situations will ultimately help you grow and it's where we grow, you know, you're not gonna, you're not gonna always, you're not gonna grow and learn a lot if you're always just doing the same exact thing in an easy environment. It's when we're challenged in a difficult environment that we really grow and truly grow. So to wrap up everybody, I appreciate everybody listening, uh, Spotify users, the YouTube people as well. There he is. Yo, I don't know what happened, but like it just cut out. But what I was gonna say, I was talking about just like putting yourself in like better environments. Like yeah. I would not have got to the point where I was, and I would not have improved like year on year, um, from month to month, if I wasn't like you know, getting out of my comfort zone. Like that's like important. It's hard to do, but yo, get out of your comfort zone. Ask to like play with clubs 
that the players are better than you, just ask if you can train like once a week. I did that like with the A team that I kept failing to get on. Mm. And it, you know, it built me up, honestly, it did. But like having that self-belief and like the work ethic, uh, work ethic and being humble, it will take you a long way. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's so, that's so solid, man. I love that advice. And especially the uncomfortable bit while you were um, uh, temporarily... No, I'm sorry about that. No, you're good, you're good. It, uh, technology, 2021. Right. Um, <laughs> you're good, you're good. Um, when, um, when you were gone, I was just saying like the importance of like you got to get out of your comfort zone to grow, man. Like, And that, yeah. that, that doesn't just go for soccer guys and girls. Like, That goes for anything anything you have to get uncomfortable to grow and it's okay to be uncomfortable to grow and it's just it's so massively important um, that, that, that's the lesson right there that that's like i said a lot but like it all kind of culminates to like yeah you have to get uncomfortable to grow like 100 percent. lovely love that okay guys um spotify listeners make sure to obviously uh rate our podcast i hope you enjoyed the content you can follow us on instagram me hash at hashirkan h-a-s-h-i-r-c-a-n mikey as well anybody if you all want to ask him questions if you want like any advice on his journey um you guys can obviously dm him as well his instagram is michael c deal that's m-i-c-h-a-e-l-c-d-i e h l for the youtube people we'll put that in the description below so you can follow him and obviously tell him that he is an absolute stud because that's what you are mikey thank you so much for coming on bro bro thank you so much for having me yes for sure perhaps we do this again and give more value to the train effective fam thank you everybody for listening train effective fam signing out